Welcome back my concrete design friends. In this video we're going to go over ACI 318, the 2019 edition, and the torsional control uh, strength requirements and some of the theory and factors that affect torsional strength characteristics. We'll make some comparisons to older code methods but we'll focus exclusively on ACI 318-19. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so we're looking at uh, torsion on this one, and again, we're looking at the ACI 318-19 code, and I want to kind of go over what the, the the basic strength requirements are for for torsion, and you'll see some very uh, common similarities to what we did with shear. So if you remember when we did shear analysis in concrete, we were looking at a concrete contribution as well as a steel contribution on there, and I'll kind of walk you through their criteria and some of the key words that have kind of changed over the last, you know, like I say, last you know, couple of decades and the way things are done, overall, it's not much different you know, from you know, the mid-90s up to now. It's just there's some terms that have changed. All right, so if you've got your code, that would be great. If not, I'll put it up on here. But I've kind of gone through and summarized the major highlights that you need to, to, to follow through. Before the ACI code, torsional requirements were scattered across about four different chapters. Now it's you're scattered across about three, so it's a little bit better, but it's still kind of hard to find the things. They have gone ahead and they have set up a um, they 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 kind of organize things by strength, okay? And so the majority of what we're looking at for torsion is located in chapter 22 of the requirements. So if I go pull that one up real quick, I think I showed this to you all last time. Okay, we're looking at, oops, one more page. The personal strength requirements will look something kind of like this. Let me pull this out a little bit. Right, get to my zoom. Okay, and so this is kind of where we're looking in the code as we're, we're dealing with everything. Now you'll notice that the, a lot of the shear requirements are being done on the section right before this because shear and torsion behave very similarly to each other okay and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of run they, they've condensed it down to three or four pages of, of requirements so it's not too really too horrible but the majority of the information that we're looking at is all gonna fall right here okay down in 22.7.1 okay and so I'm gonna kind of walk you through and I've kind of summarized and added some notes to what the code is requiring now part of that whoops let's hit my camera Part of that comes from you know, basic mechanics. Part of it comes from mathematics. Um, I need to get that under to get rid of the glare. I finally figured out what the glare was coming from. It's kind of interesting. I have a black desk and it was reflecting and overexposing the camera so I could at least get things under control. So anyway, sorry. Okay, so the first requirement that we're looking at here has to do with a, this term that's called as the threshold torsion value. It used to be that you were looking for a specific percentage of the concrete strength in torsion or the cracking strength in torsion. And if you think about what we did with shear, that was what we did, right? We went through and we calculated a concrete contribution, usually two root F prime C B W D was the concrete portion. And then to that we added steel. And then we put some limits on how much steel you could add to maintain ductility. Torsion does the same thing. Okay. But in this one, you know, where if you remember in shear when we drew our picture of the, the shear diagram, we had those horizontal lines that included, you know, you know, the concrete contribution, VC, and then also had a VC over two line, right? Remember, and if our shear fell below that, then we didn't have to provide any extra steel, right? And so that was kind of you know, the, the, the no stirrups required um, in that region. If you think about that, that was what they were calling as a threshold shear. They don't call it that in the ACI code for some reason, so there's a bit of an inconsistency. But in torsion, they do call it um, as, as a threshold value, all right? And so that's what you're seeing coming out of here. Now, a couple of things that, so basically it boils down to, and again, I've kind of written some of this, is that our factored torsional load, if it is, um, must be less than or equal to our threshold torsion value, if that's less than that, we don't have to consider torsion at all. 
Okay, now the question becomes, well, what is this value? And I'll get to that a little bit later down on the page, okay? So there is a, you know, we can completely neglect torsion so long as we don't exceed this limit, okay? And it turns out that that limit is about a fourth of what the cracking torque value is. And I'll show you how to calculate that here, like I say, in just a second. Um, there is a limit on what you can count on the square root of F prime C value, okay? That F prime C less than or equal to 100 PSI. If you look at that number, that means for concrete strengths that are greater than 10,000 PSI, the method, um, you're limited. All right, so these ultra high strength concrete values, there just isn't enough research for them to conclusively determine if there's something special going on at those higher strengths. Okay, there is research going on um, in that area, but uh, so, so there is a limit on this. Now, for all the problems we're going to see in our class, it's not going to be an issue because F prime C is like 3,000 or 4,000. We're well under that limit. But if you start getting into... 15,000, 20,000 PSI concrete, you know, some bridge girders are now pushing, you know, 10, 12, 14,000 PSI, especially in the pre-stress realm, you start having some issues, okay, um, there are requirements related to pre-stressing in this methodology, we're not going to talk about those, we're only going to talk about just the regular reinforced sections on there, all right, okay, so now, if you remember when we were talking about torsion, we talked about two different types, okay, and so they've basically said the requirements are different for each of the two types. The first one was the equilibrium torsion, right? And if you remember the picture on the next page here, remember those guys, right? The top one is an equilibrium torsion. Basically, the torque that's going into this beam is being caused by just the, you know, by this canopy on here, and it will apply all of its force into that member, and there's no way for it to redistribute or go somewhere else, okay? You know, if it cracks or softens, the stiffness softens, it doesn't change the capacity. All of it goes into this. This is equilibrium torsion. The other one was our compatibility torsion, which is, well, the effect, you know, how much this beam feels in torque is in part due to what the stiffness of this beam is, as well as what's going on on the other end of the support. Okay, and so you remember we drew, let's see if I can find those pictures real quick in the last packet. Oh, lost it. Nope. We drew a diagram that looked something kind of like those, remember? Where we were kind of working on these. And so this was the equilibrium case, cantilever, point load on the end, all of that load goes into the member, whereas here it was a cantilever that was supported on the other end or had some stiffness or something restraining it, that what happens is, is that even though I know the moment value here is zero, if I allow this you know, compatibility, if I crack it at B, then basically that changes the support condition here and you can actually modify your, uh, your, your moment diagrams in that member as a result of it. And so depending on the degree of cracking, you can actually kind of start to alter, you know, well, okay, I can, lim I can reduce the value of the torque here, you know, the stress here, but I've got to account for an increase in the moment capacity as a result of that change. That's kind of what they're talking about on this. And you'll hear this term redistribution used a lot, okay? So, so that's the benefit of this methodology is that I can kind of move load from one spot to the other. So, you know, notice if you start here, this line gets smaller, but here it gets bigger. It's moving from here over to here. And that's kind of what we're talking about with the redistribution. And so we kind of outlined that a little bit last time. All right, All right. So, so that was the requirement that we have. So for the code requirements then, that if it's equilibrium torsion, then absolutely the torsional limit or the applied load, you know, you know, if that load is greater than the cracking stress and torque, you know, then you must design for the full TU. Okay, you can't redistribute or move anything around. Okay, compatibility torsion says, hey, if re redistribution is possible, and we'll talk in future kind of how you know when it is or when it isn't, you may take TU as equal to the cracking torque. Okay, that I can limit this, and that could be if you've got redistribution, that could be a great savings in, in you know, in strength, you know, because you know may, this might be 25% of what the ultimate is, but if I allow it to redistribute and I account for it somewhere else, maybe it's more efficient to do it in flexure, and a bump up the longitudinal steel as a result of that. Okay, now it's not mandatory that you do that, and normally, if I'm doing you know the the times that I've had to consider torsion, I usually just design for TU straight out. And just don't even worry about the redistribution. But you can if you want to do the extra analysis and go to the extra steps, okay, as a result. All right. So, so that's kind of the, the general basics, uh, the basic philosophy of what's going on on this. To, to head off this, just use TU and you'll be good to go, okay, as, as what you're designing for. And that's the approach that we've talked about. Now, 
here are the two terms that matter in what we're doing. The first one is the threshold torsional value. Okay, for non-pre-stressed beams, this comes out of a table that is on this page, the next page over. Okay, so all of those are coming out of these two tables. Now, if you look at the formulas, I don't see a difference in any of the formulas, whether you're in this table or that table. Okay, and so this is the threshold torsion for a solid cross-section, something that isn't open. You know, that's, uh, and then you have the threshold torsion for the hollow shapes on there. And I guess the, the well, I guess I do see the difference. Here it's ACP squared, and here it's a, you know, kind of the 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 A. I can't even read that line anymore. It should be an A. Is that an A? Wow, my eyesight's really bad today. I believe that's an A naught. Okay, but there that's the only difference in these two tables is that term right there, as we start to kind of look at it. So we're going to kind of work off of you no. Know, you know, kind of the solid cross-sectional state, and then we're going to come back and we'll kind of play with this a naught squared value here, and kind of we talked about what those were last time. Okay, so so that's your threshold torsion. On the bottom of this section is the cracking torque table values, and so if you look at the formula for that versus what we had up here, four lambda square root f prime c, and then it's ACP squared over PCP. Okay, so ACP is the perimeters of the concrete. Um, cross section it's the gross dimensions you know your beam is 12 by 18 ACP is 12 times 18 okay versus the a naught H value that we talked about last time which was the area confined by the stirrups right remember we kind of talked about those differences. so you got to kind of watch your subscripts on those if you ever get stuck on what a term means you can jump up to the front of the book up here kind of around page 26 and they outline every single variable and what it is and so if I flip all the way back up to the beginning you can see that you now my ACP definition would be right here is the area enclosed by the outside perimeter of concrete cross-section okay versus say our a naught which we're looking at or even a naught H which would be here, these two values, they actually define what those are. So if you ever can't find them, just flip back up to the front. This is up in uh, like section two of the table, okay? So A0H is the area enclosed by the center line of the outermost closed transverse torsional reinforcement. So that's the outermost stirrup. And A0 is the gross area enclosed by the sh torsional shear flow path, okay? And this is the one that's generally a little bit harder to calculate, but they're gonna give you kind of a quick and easy way to do that here in just a second on on our formulas here. So that's what we're kind of playing with. Um, other things that we notice, um, phi for torsion comes out of the phi tables up in chapter 21. So you gotta go look elsewhere. Phi for torsion is 0.75. Okay, and that's a change from before where it used to be like 0.85. Okay, and so so this is the new value in the, in the 19 code. Okay, now if you notice the difference between threshold torsion and cracking torque, what do you notice is the difference? And again, this is for the solid shapes, if you will. The only difference in the formula is that four right there. So the cracking torque is actually four times the threshold torque. So if you look at what that means, if you go back and consider that I've got to consider torsion when I'm less than, when I, um, you know, if I, um, it can be neglected if I'm less than or equal to the threshold value on here, right? So that's the, basically the same thing as saying that if TU is less than or equal to phi TCR, the cracking torque factor divided by four, you can neglect torsion. All right, so instead of being like what we saw with direct shear where it was VC over two or phi VC over two, now it's uh, phi TCR over uh, four. Uh, I'm the way it will. Could you let me in, please? All right, All right gotcha. Okay, all right, so, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Now, something interesting is also happening in the cracking torque formula. If you remember when we talked about tensile stresses in concrete, we talked about the modulus of rupture, we talked about the uniform axial, we also talked about this inclined uh, uh, diagonal tension of concrete. And for an element that's subjected to shear that looks something kind of like this, okay, I get a crack that comes across this direction Okay, the limit on that stress was always around four root f prime c. Okay, well if you look, there's the four root f prime c hiding in there. So it's coming out of the basic mechanics approaches and then the concrete strength that you guys learned about back in our regular concrete class. So this four root f prime c is a big, uh, is, 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 a, is a common number 
that will pop up over and over um, for for torsion and for shear both. And so so that's where this is coming from. Okay, and so then you've got these these perimeter values and the, the gross concrete section values for cracking. Notice that the, the cracking torque takes ACP, which was the, the gross profile area, right? If my if my section is those dimensions, then it's this whole area. Okay, whereas the A naught value you know, might have a stirrup in here that once you get crack it, now you're only allowed to count the, the inner portion of it. All right, this is my A naught or um, the A naught H value, and this was ACP or the gross area. Does that make sense? You see the difference in the two? Okay, so before cracking, you can count the whole thing. After it cracks, you can only count what's inside the stirrup. You neglect everything else outside of that. You neglect the, the because it's assumed that this, this coating outside the stirrup will fall off due to torsion and shear and all the other effects that it will just flake off on there. So we completely discount it on there. All right, so that's kind of where we're going in some of the logic and the stuff that you've seen before. All right, okay, the next one we talked about, we talked about the equations last time. So the torsional strength itself comes off of two formulas. It's Tn, right? And so the first one was uh, our transverse limit, which was based on the amount of stirrup steel that's being provided or torsional transverse reinforcement, I could calculate a torque value that that section would be able to, uh, to handle. And then the longitudinal um, area also limits the torque value. And then instead of At, I use Al. Okay, notice that there's a theta that runs around in this. That comes back to our truss models that we talked about. Okay, and so some of the terms that you see, this is just basically you know what your steel is and you check both limits and you choose the lower of the two as your torsional value. And that has to be greater than the limit that you're studying. So AT is the area of one leg of a stirrup. AL is the area of the longitudinal torsional reinforcement. This is extra longitudinal steel in addition to anything required for shear, anything required for axial, anything required for moment. It's additional steel. All right, so they call that as A sub L. Okay, pH is the perimeter of the outermost closed stirrup. So if we went back to our picture here, that would be the perimeter around the stirrup here. Okay, so that's your P naught H. And then S is what is considered to be your stirrup spacing. Because a lot of times what we do is we design for shear and we get a stirrup spacing for direct shear. And then we set our additional torsional steel using the same spacing parameter. That way we can just increase the bar size instead of having to put a bunch of extra stirrups in, in certain regions. So, so that's what we're looking at there. Um, let's see. Next section is 22.7.6.1. Okay, that has to do with how do you calculate this A0 value. Okay, and so for that they're going to refer you to another figure. Okay. And again, a lot of this, it's all, it's pretty compact in where it's located. I like that feature of this, of the new code. Okay, and so this is our, you know, we take our definition of A naught H, and so that shaded region, that's the area that is including A naught H. Notice that if you have an opening, you just count the opening as part of A naught H. Okay, so, so you don't, you don't subtract that off of there. But what the, the code says over in 22.7.6.1 over here says that you can either calculate it by analysis or just take it as 85% of the A naught H value. And most often this is what we do for rectangular and circular shapes. We just go ahead and use that. So that's, so that's the limit that's happening here. So 0.85 A naught H or by analysis A naught H comes from the diagrams that I just showed you. Okay, good so far? All right, the next one then has to do with, well, how do you choose theta? Okay, now you're allowed to take from truss models theta somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees. Those are the limits. If it's a pre-stress section, theta is generally down around 35 degrees. Um, but for non-pre-stress, normally it's taken as theta is equal to 45 degrees. Okay, again, that's that truss model simplification that they use in the ACI code. This is pretty much what you'll want to use is 45 here. You can use anything, but 45 it will work out um, it's the easiest and the most straightforward if you just keep it at 45. Okay, but that's actually spelled out here, okay, in part A of this. And they do have pre-stressing options, but again, we're not looking at that. And I, I misspoke. It's 37 and a half, not 35, but it's all right around that area on there. Okay, all right. Now, so, so that gets us to there. Now, if you remember, back in, back when we did shear, remember we said Vn was equal to Vc plus vs right and this guy was always two root f prime c bwd 
And this guy was whatever you chose based off of the stirrup area and the stirrup steel that you chose to use, right? But if you remember, there was a limit of VS max. Do you remember what the limit was? 8 root F prime C BWD, right? Okay, and so that was our maximum limit. And if you remember what this was doing is this was basically saying, hey, we don't want you getting, you know, if you have a real high shear load and a real small cross section where this number is really small, we don't want you getting stupid and just saying, I'm just going to put a ton of steel in this thing and over reinforce it. Okay, so they're, they're, this is a protection for basically the dimension that you have to have a certain size of dimension for certain values of shear and, you know, for a certain values of shear. Do you remember doing that? You're kind of looking at that limit. And so basically, if we took this as 2 root F prime C, that our, that our VN, our dimensional check, we were always looking at 10 root F prime C BWD as being our dimensional check on dimensions to make sure that we weren't using too small of a section for it. Okay, torsion is going to do the same thing. In fact, you're going to see 8 root F prime C start running around again in this. Okay, and that's where this section is. So there are two pieces of this. And again, that's coming out of these requirements here. Okay, that we're looking at the cross-sectional dimensional limits. Okay, for solid sections, you're going to do this inequality. And it's basically, and if you look, it's, it looks like it's kind of a confusing, you know, a, a confusing term. But really, if you look at the individual pieces, it makes a lot of sense. All right, so we're going to do the square root of VU over BWD plus TU PH over 1.7 A naught H quantity squared. And then that whole thing squared. Okay, and what this is, if you look at this, I have a shear over a width times a depth. This is kind of an average shear stress calculation. Okay, and this is the average shear stress due to direct shear, V, not T. Okay, so this is a shear stress, or what we usually call as tau, due to direct shear. Over here, then, I have a torque, I have a perimeter, and I have that, that area. This becomes like the, the, the shear stress due to torsion. Okay, and if you think of these as vectors, then if I, you know, if I add these two quantities together, I can get the resulting magnitude of the combined shear stress. Because remember, taus from different sources are additive. Okay, and so, so that's what we have happening here. On the other side, they're now going over and saying that this limit, this is the applied load, applied shear, applied torque, this is the load side. Over here, then, is the strength side. Okay, and if you look, what do we have? We have phi VC over BWD. That's the average stress in concrete at the point where we consider it to have cracked due to direct shear. Okay, plus, look what just showed up, 8 root F prime C. Okay, this is the limit to make sure that we always have ductile behavior in the steel. Okay, so the only thing that you can control in order to get this limit, if you have very high torques and very high shear loads, the only parameter that you can change is BW and D. Or I guess you can change F prime C if you want as well, but you know, but that's what we're looking at, and so that's why this will, you know you have to have certain B and Ds in order to make this equation work for the solid sections, All right? For hollow sections, it's very similar. The formula is a little bit different, but it's the same basic terminology and the same limit on the right side. Okay, so that is kind of like your V S max. This is your V S max term here. Okay, now. It's kind of interesting, you know, the other things that you might notice in this is if I go back and I look at my, my torsional strength calculations, the, one, the ones that were up here, this was the nominal strength of torsion, right? We had two different equations. What's missing from this term? What doesn't show up anywhere in this calculation? F, yeah, F prime C is not in there, right? So what they're saying is, is that the torsional strength of concrete we're going to completely neglect it. Okay, it's on, the torsional strength in a concrete cross section is only attributed to the steel. Okay, the transverse stirrups here and the longitudinals here. Right. So if we look at what that kind of means, there is no concrete contribution. Okay. So if we think of this, you know, before we had, you know, VN was equal to VS plus VC, and we were playing that game. Of course, V's on it, or whatever the case may be. If we play the same game with torsion. The equation that we saw was only a TS term, okay? So in torsion, we're going to neglect the concrete strength of this, you know, because that's what we were getting in that other requirement, okay? And that should make sense, right? If I claim the concrete strength for the direct shear VC, then I can't count on it again for the torsional value. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so, so that's what they've done. It, it implies that the torsional strength of concrete we're going to neglect it because almost always you have shear present with it. Okay, now I guess if you had a pure shear situation, you could use your engineering judgment 
you know, if VN was zero, but somehow you had a torque, which very seldom happens, then I guess you could probably back into a term here and increase the capacity a little bit. But most of the time we just take it as zero on that. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. All right. The other thing that we can do, and we talked about this one last time, I just included it here just to be thorough on our summary sheet, is that if I go back and I assume that I'm going to design this torsional value to be for the same value, I can relate the area of transverse steel to the area of the longitudinal requirement. I can relate those two to each other. So if I do a little bit of algebra and set this equation equal to this one, I get this. But the area of the longitudinal steel is going to be equal to the area of the transverse over the spacing times pH times the ratio of the yield stresses of the transverse to the longitudinal times cotangent squared theta. So if you design for a certain amount of transverse steel, I know exactly how much longitudinal I need to get the same strength. Okay, so that's kind of a quick shortcut formula rather than doing a two-step process of designing it here, calculating TN, and then turning around and coming and checking for the longitudinal. You can actually relate them and kind of shortcut the design process a little bit by setting that limit. Okay, so that's kind of a handy little formula to have in your pocket. It's not in the code, it's not in your textbook, but it is a kind of a handy relationship to help you size things in a hurry if you're looking at it, all right? Okay, now for the part where it gets a little bit confusing if you're not already confused. Torsion's a fun topic, isn't it? Okay, all right. What do we do about calculating the total reinforcement required? Okay, when we calculate this, Okay, it, it's, it's interesting because we're playing with two different shear components. We're playing with direct shear, we're playing with um, you know, torsion, and each one is contributing an area of steel to the cross section. Okay, so our additional torsional steel results are going to be for those that are in addition to whatever you find from other load cases, whether it's a moment, whether it's a direct shear, or whether it's an axial load. AL and AT are in addition to. Okay, so now, what we want to do when we set up our design is when we were doing direct shear, we were doing AV over S. Remember seeing that ratio? And if you chose a number three bar, you had one spacing. If you chose a number four bar, you had a different spacing. But that ratio was constant for both. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the area of the stirrups for both torsion and shear is the direct shear piece plus now what is going to be our AT over S. Now, for this, we're going to put a two on here assuming that it's a double-legged stirrup, all right? And so that will be the area of steel that you're adding to, to the bar. So the AV is our total shear reinforcement, which is the number of stirrup legs times the area of the bar in, um, in the shear steel, okay? And then AT is the area of a single leg of, close, of a closed stirrup. Because remember, the torsional steel, we're only looking at one face at a time. So if we look at, say, this section, I had torsion in the right, I had torsion in the top, torsion in the bottom, or left, and torsion in the bottom, right? And we built our truss model off of just one face. So this is the only bar that shows up in the right face. This is the only bar that shows up in the left face. And so the area of steel of this guy is just one single bar, if you will, okay? And I'll show you, I've got some other pictures that we'll go here to kind of explain that in a little bit more detail. Okay, we're we doing good so far, any questions? I know I'm going kind of fast, but most of this is in the code. But I want to kind of want to get through this, and then we'll talk more next time um, as we go through all, on this. All right, so here are some common situations to kind of illustrate what's going on. Okay, the common case is you have one stirrup all the way around out of all of the outer bars. Now, you guys know that there are some detailing issues with having four bars in a line. You can only go every three. There are some issues with this, but just kind of in general, the example here is, is that this is a double-legged stirrup, okay, for, for direct shear. Okay, so we have a two-leg stirrups for shear. Okay, so an AV over S, where AV is the total stirrup area or the area of two legs. Okay, that was how we de defined AV, right? Okay, now take a look at a case where I have a multiple leg situation. For shear, our AV over S required was based on the area of all stirrup legs. So this one would be based off of this leg plus this leg plus this one plus this one. You would have four stirrups, and they're assuming that they're all the same size. Okay, and so this would be the area of four times the area of the bar um, associated with direct shear. You guys with me on that? And again, so you have to kind of know what the reinforcing looks like in the cross section as you start to try to figure this out. Okay, for torsion, one bar leg. For torsion in this one, one bar leg. These guys in the middle are doing nothing for torsion. Okay, 
Now, we might need it for direct shear, but so that's why we want to make sure this outer one is picking up enough strength for our torsional, for our torsional limit. So if I put them together for shear plus torsion, only the outer legs are effective. Okay, really only one leg. So you can size the outer legs then by taking a, uh, for shear plus torsion over S, that number is going to be the sum of AV over S, where the AV is the area of two or four legs from our pictures, okay, or six or however many legs you have, plus then 2AT over S, because that torsional stirrup, this was my AT value, but it was actually two of them because it was one bar and it went so it goes over and it adds to the other side. Okay, and so that's how, so this one stirrup had two legs, but our strength calc was only for one of them. So, so that's kind of a kind of a subtle point. Does that make sense? Let's see what's kind of happening there. The stirrup that I'm specking out is this whole thing. So if I provide this AT value, he's going to add double that to the whole thing. Whereas this is going to only add double to it also. The ones in the middle do nothing. So I want to kind of kind of kind of provide that and again the last little thing to remind you all of is is that additional reinforcing may be necessary you know to provide the any additional shear capacity you know whether it's AV or or direct shear or whatever the case may be but that's kind of the, the rundown of the strength calculations for ACI it's pretty easy They're all within about three or four pages um, I re strongly recommend as you're looking at this that you go in and you read the commentary there's a lot of useful information about why they're doing things and why limits are set the way they are but just keep in mind it's very similar especially these formulas are very similar to what we saw back in shear when we were doing direct shear for, for our beams back in our uh, 342 concrete class so I hope that's made some sense to you um, like I said if you got any questions I'm happy to answer them